Hello. In this video, we're going to take a look at operators and observables. In particular, we have the following. Observable quantities, which we usually abbreviate to observables, are represented by emission operators in quantum mechanics. So let's look at an example first, and it should be very familiar to us at this point. It's just the Hamiltonian, which uh, you may recall is referred to as the energy operator, uh, and it solves the uh, sorry, and, and uh, it uh, forms the time-independent Schrödinger equation here, where these uh, states or kets phi subscript n are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, uh, and en are the corresponding eigen energies. Uh, so we've seen this written in a uh, differential form as a differential operator, which looks like this. So we've written it uh, in three dimensions as minus h bar squared over 2m grad squared uh, plus v acting on phi nx. Uh, and v, we've occasionally written as v hat here, indicating it's an operator. When it acts on a function of position like this, it simply becomes, which hopefully you can read, is uh, v and then in parentheses x. So v of x, the potential. This term here, which may have looked a little bit mysterious, um, since we know that the uh, Hamiltonian corresponds to an energy, and an energy should have a kinetic part and a potential part, and V of X is the potential part, we can deduce that this should be the uh, kinetic part. Uh, the kinetic energy should be P squared over 2M. So this leads us to deduce that this quantity should probably be written as some operator P, so P hat, squared over 2M. And this P is what we call the momentum operator. So uh, we've mainly worked with the Hamiltonian. Uh, it, it can be a, a finite dimensional matrix, big N by big N. And we've seen an example of a finite dimensional complex Hilbert space uh, in the previous video where we're looking at spin a half. So uh, in finite dimensional systems, the Hamiltonian will be a matrix. Um, in fact, the phrase operator refers to matrices in finite numbers of dimensions, but it also applies to infinite numbers of dimensions. Uh, and when we have an infinite dimensional uh, Hilbert space, uh, what we're really talking about is the matrix Hamiltonian turns into this differential operator. So we've actually already done the hard case. The infinite dimensional Hilbert space, that sounds daunting, but actually all it means is that we're working, for example, in the position basis, like this, and so our states are labelled by their functions, and they're labelled by a position. But a position can take any of an infinite number of values along the line. It's a real number. Uh, and for each of those, we would like to think of it as a different basis vector. So what we're saying in terms of uh, matrices and vectors is something like this. So it's a bit strange. It looks like a tautology. But we're saying there exists um, a position operator, x with a hat on it, uh, and there are eigenstates of this operator, and we'll denote those with a ket with an x in it. And the eigenvalues of the x operator acting on ket x, uh, it comes out as the position x, the real number. Okay, so we knew such an, we know such an operator must exist, so we, we posit it to exist in our structure, because positions are observable quantities. We can see a particle at a position, so that this is a quantity we can assign to it. Um, but also I'm saying that we should have this other operator, p, and so we deduce that must obey the following equation. It looks similarly tautological, but bear in mind again that these are different things. This is an operator, uh, either a matrix or uh, a differential operator. Um, this is an eigenstate of that operator, and this is an eigenvalue, which is just a real number. So as we'll see uh, in, uh, the in, a, in a later video, uh, the momentum, so the position and momentum operators, when written in real space, uh, are as follows. Okay, so working in what we call the position basis in quantum mechanics, writing things as functions in terms uh, functions of position. Uh, the x, the position operator, is simply x, the uh, the position uh, in real space, and the momentum operator p. Um, we can deduce from this that p squared over two m is equal to minus h bar squared grad squared over two m. But up to a sign, um, p the operator has to be minus i h bar grad, or in one dimension, minus i h bar d by dx. So we'll take a look at what that really means in a couple of videos' time. For now, um, let's work entirely with the operators. So when uh, Heisenberg wrote down what's called matrix mechanics, which is what we're really studying here, um, 
he chose to use uh, matrices and their infinite dimensional generalizations, which are operators, uh, for the following reason, that matrices need not commute. And in fact, he took from experiments uh, the following um, kind of mathematically uh, intuitive guess. So he guessed that the position operator and the momentum operator should, well, he knew that they shouldn't commute. Um, the reason they, they shouldn't commute is much like we saw uh, in the previous video when we looked at spin a half systems. Remember, in that case, the Stern Gerlach experiment tells us that um, if we have definite information about the spin in the x direction, uh, we must be completely uncertain about its value in the uh, y and z directions. And so this suggests a structure like matrices, because um, if two matrices commute, then they can have a set of simultaneous eigenvectors. Um, but if they don't commute, then they can't have a simultaneous set of eigenvectors. And so it admits a structure in which we can have things like operator x and operator p, um, and if they don't commute, it means that we can't know x and p at the same time. So Heisenberg took this from uh, the various pieces of experimental information uh, and guessed that we can try and phrase the behavior of quantum particles in terms of operators like this. Uh, and in particular, the, the inspired guess of his is what's called the canonical commutation relation, which is what's written here, which is that the commutator of x and p, how much they fail to commute, is given by i h bar, and this fat one with a hat on it is called the identity operator. And it's, it's the, a trivial operator which acts on any state and gives the state back. So it's like the one of operators. So um, it's got the reduced Planck's constant in it, which is good because generally that should appear if we're studying quantum problems. Um, and it's got an I in it, which uh, is, uh, so there's a mathematical reason that this must appear, but you can see that in general, um, I, uh, the complex numbers are important to quantum mechanics. So let's put a box around this. So this is a really important relation which we'll come back to repeatedly in this course. So we'd like um, to try and represent uh, observable quantities with things like uh, matrices, because then we can have the property that they don't commute, and we don't necessarily, we may not be able to have simultaneous knowledge of two different ones. Uh, the reason they should be Hermitian is that Hermitian uh, matrices have real eigenvalues, and in general Hermitian operators have real eigenvalues, uh, and every number we measure in reality is, is a real number. So that's why we have this structure in quantum mechanics. Okay, so let's uh, put this to some use to derive a very famous result. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So we de define the uncertainty in quantity to be its standard deviation as follows. So the standard deviation of a quantity is given by the uh, square of the quantity and the average over that minus the average of the quantity squared, and then we square root that. Uh, and there's a uh, not too difficult but uh, somewhat lengthy uh, derivation of the following result. The product of the uncertainties uh, in operators A and B and the corresponding observables must be greater than or equal to a half multiplied by the modulus of the average of the commutator of the quantities or of the corresponding operators. Uh, so in particular, we could take the case of the canonical commutation relations, substitute it in, and we find that the product of the uncertainties of position and momentum must be greater than or equal to h bar over 2. So the uncertainty principle tells us that the more accurately we know the position of a particle, the less accurately we're able to know the momentum, and vice versa. Now, it's an inherently quantum mechanical effect, but there is a classical precedent for it. If we take uh, a rope and we establish a standing wave along that rope, so let me try and get you one, there we go, one with a node in the center. There we go. So I, you can, looking at that standing wave, it's possible to say what the wavelength is, you can see that there was a full wavelength along the rope's length there, or in this case, I could get half a wavelength along the rope's length. Um, I can know the wavelength perfectly, and then from the de Broglie relation, we can assign a momentum to that wave. But then if you ask the question, where is the particle, or, or where, is, where is the wave located, clearly it's along the entire length of the rope. So
also, it's as unknown as it's possible to be. It's completely spread out along the rope. On the other hand, if I take the rope and I whip it, I can send a disturbance along the rope, like that. And then you can say fairly accurately where the uh, disturbance is, and it's acting kind of like a particle. Um, but if you were to ask what the wavelength of that uh, disturbance is, it doesn't have one, right? It's not got uh, the same shape as a wave. In fact, what you'd have to do is carry out a Fourier analysis and you'd find that that disturbance is described by uh, an infinite set of uh, the, the possible standing waves on the row. So you can know the position of the disturbance or you can know the wavelength and from that deduce the momentum. Um, but you can't know both simultaneously and the more you know one, the less you know the other and vice versa. So there are several different uh, uncertainty principles or, or different sets of pairs of operators and observables uh, which have uncertainty relations with them. So one is position and momentum. Another is energy and time. We have to be a bit careful about what we mean by this one and it's difficult to quantify it in quite the same sense mathematically because there is no time operator in quantum mechanics. Time is special, things are just a function of time. Um, uh, but we know that there is some kind of an uncertainty relation between these two because, for example, if we have a particle which is going to decay after some finite amount of time, uh, the shorter lived the particle, the, uh, so the more accurately we know the decay time, the less accurately we know its energy, and vice versa. Uh, and there are various other energy time uncertainties we can form. Again, you can sort of get a, a classical idea for this by bearing in mind that the energy is related to the uh, frequency of the particle. Uh, and in order to establish the frequency of some kind of, of, of periodically changing wave, you need to measure a few cycles of it in order to get the frequency. Um, so if you localize it too much in time, you can't get the frequency information, so you lose the energy information. Uh, we've seen there's an uncertainty relation uh, between uh, spin in different directions. We, if we know the spin in the x direction, say, we have complete uncertainty about the spin in the y direction. Spin is a form of angular momentum, the intrinsic angular momentum, and in fact, more generally, angular momentum, as we will see in future videos, um, also is an observable in quantum mechanics, and there is also no uncertainty relation between angular momentum in different directions. And there's also an uncertainty relation uh, for superconductors and superfluids, which aren't part of this course. But in that case, you have a condensate with many different particles in it, forming a macroscopic quantum mechanical wave function. Uh, and the more accurately you know the number of particles in the condensate, uh, the less accurately you can know the phase of the condensate, and vice versa. So this is a list of some of the uncertainty relations which come up in quantum mechanics. You'll notice the top two actually are Fourier transforms of one another. So another classical precedent for the uncertainty relation is in the signals analysis, um, where if you localize uh, some kind of signal in, in the direct space, the Fourier transform signal is less well localized and vice versa. You can think of this in terms of Gaussians, for example. If you Fourier transform a Gaussian, you get another Gaussian back. But if you make the direct space Gaussian narrower, so you know the location of it uh, more accurately, the Fourier transform gets broader.